And okay, our facilitator for Veg Club tonight is Carol Appenseller. Carol thinks about growing food more than anyone probably should. And we really appreciate her for that. It's to our benefit because she's been growing for almost three decades on Bainbridge Island. Well, actually about half of that time spent on Bainbridge Island, but three decades of experience in the garden. Carol has the equivalent of 33 four by eight foot beds on her less than half quarter acre lot, which is an inspiration for every vegetable garden grower west of the Cascades. Please welcome Carol Appenseller. You're muted, Carol. I'm an expert at this. I'm glad you're here, everybody. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk soil. And we're doing that because I got feedback because of those surveys that you do at the end of class. And people said they were really interested in soils. So um, we do, uh, I do change things uh, based on your feedback. And I'd like to hear more about what you'd like at the end of this class as well. So we're talking soil tonight. And the first thing to think about is our, our growing systems and our soil systems um, for the history of the world, the history of agriculture, certainly, there was no such thing as organic farming because there was no alternative. It's just the way nutrients cycled in the world. So this was farming. And even though the wild systems don't use cows, this is pretty much the way nutrients went around in the world. In the soil, there were all these cycles of nitrogen and water and phosphorus. And then we came up with this. Does anybody have a guess what that is? You can guess to yourself or aloud. This person is concentrating nitrogen. And you might think it's for fertilizer, but it's not for fertilizer. It's for bombs because the N in TNT is nitro. So we knew how to do this for about 100 years, but it was really expensive. And then in World War II, we really needed to do it to make lots of bombs. So we federally funded like 10 factories to do this. And at the end of the war, we didn't need bombs anymore. We needed food. The world was had been starving and American farmers had an opportunity to use this nitrogen to do well by doing good. So we came up with synthetic fertilizers. And this picture contrasts organic fertilizers to synthetics, but it really should be organic fertilizers and amendments to, fer to synthetics. So here's the difference between a fertilizer and an amendment. Fertilizers are concentrated and have known amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And examples are like fish emulsion, blood meal, or a bag of that stuff that says 563 on the front. And amendments, Organic amendments are less concentrated. They have more carbon, which um, is food for soil organisms because we can't break down fiber, soluble or insoluble. We say, oh, it's not, it, we used to think it wasn't useful for anything in our bodies, but we're finding that all sorts of bacteria can eat those and they do so in the soil. So it improves the texture of the soil and the characteristics of the soil. And some examples are compost and rotted manure and leaf mold. And manure can actually be both because it can be very high in nutrients. So we did this. And organic fertilizers and amendments feed the soil. You've probably heard of feeding the soil. Um, you are actually feeding things. It's not a metaphor. Organic fertilizers, and et cetera, can't be used by the plants. The things in them, a lot of the stuff in them anyway, is not in a form that plants will take up. So they have to be torn apart and reassembled into forms that the plants will absorb. And the way that happens is they go through the guts of microorganisms and then they're taken up by the plants. 
So this is <clears throat> carbon and nitrogen and all these whole things that we're putting in there. Synthetic fertilizers are quite different. They're water soluble and they just get dissolved in the water. They're stripped down molecules and they go straight into the plant, which is why you kind of have to be careful with them. So when we switched over um, from synthetics to organics, I mean, from organics to synthetics, we forgot to keep putting organic material into the soil for a while. This is analogous. Um, the organic side is really analogous to your gut bacteria. They eat fiber and things that we don't recognize as food. That's why we can take manure that's already been, you know, supposedly had the good food taken out of it, feed it to the soil. And there's a ton of stuff in there that they can use. That's analogous to you eating an entire orange because you need sugar and vitamin C. And synthetic is quite analogous in my mind to you saying, I need blood sugar and vitamin C. So I'm gonna put some sugar and some vitamin C powder and some water and drink it. It's still there, you're still using it, it goes straight into you that way, but it doesn't feed your gut bacteria. So when we got really excited about these synthetics, we, um, as I say, forgot the organic stuff. So this is what happened. What do you think of that? When I see those arrows of nutrients dropping down, I hear a thud in my head. And there are a couple of reasons this happened. One is that we chose different varieties. We bred different varieties of crops, which hopefully Judy Hart will tell us about in a future class. But the other one is that we, we really treated the soil differently. And you might think, well, this is just one research project. It's just one piece of data, but it's not the only one. There they are. I'll let you just skim those. I especially like the bottom one that says to get as much vitamin A as your grandparents from one orange, you'd have to eat eight oranges. I thought that was kind of cool. So we kind of woke up and we realized there's more to it. The soil is not just a matrix from which plants can suck nutrients. There are things going on in there. So now even the fairly um, intellectually conservative USDA says soil is a vital living ecosystem. So we can, as home gardeners, we can really take advantage of that. It makes things easier for us. So the question tonight is how can I support healthy soil? How can I support the systems that create healthy soil? So one, first thing you can do is understand the stuff that isn't alive in your soil and how it affects the stuff that is alive in your soil. So we all know people complain if they have a lot of sand in their soil because it drains too fast. But the great thing about sand is it drains really fast. And then people complain about too much clay in their soil because it holds moisture and it gets really condensed and things like that. But the great thing about clay is it holds moisture and it also holds nutrients really well. And silt is kind of in between the two. Um, here's why clay holds better nutrients better than sand does. So if you have a piece of sand this big, um, all of these, I should start with this, all of these particles have negatively charged surfaces. This is the most detailed thing I'm gonna say all tonight, I think. They have negatively charged surfaces and positive things love to stick to those surfaces. A lot of soil nutrients are positively charged. This will come up later but they can only stick to the surface. So sand, this big grain of sand has this much surface area. But if we had a bunch of clay that was this big, it would actually be thousands and thousands and thousands of little clay particles. And each one of those would have its own surface area. So the surface area would be multiplied all the way through that blob of clay. In fact, this is what clay looks like. It looks like little flakes and each flake has that full surface area that the nutrients can get in between there. And this shape, uh, this micro shape of clay is also why it's slippery because these particles slide. I think it's cool that the micro stuff tells you, you know, why the macro happens. 
So you can actually figure out what your, um, what your soil is if you're really interested. You don't have to figure it out, but it might be interesting to you and I'll show you that in a minute. But first, a little bit of vocab. You might've heard of loam. So some clay, some sand, and a little bit of organic matter is called loam and we like it. Notice that's not a powder that he's holding, that's chunky. So you can do, if you're curious about your soil, you can do this mason jar soil texture test where you may have seen people do it before. You put it in water, your soil in water, helps if you have some powdered dishwasher detergent and shake it up and you leave it there. And then you literally measure the height of each layer. So you go, oh, I think the sand is down here. And then this looks silty. And then there's this, about four days later, there's this little bit of clay. And there's, you measure it and you can figure out the percents. And then you can put it in this little, I think it's a USDA site um, that shows you what kind of soil you have based on those numbers. So I have two links, um, maybe three actually, on the resource page. And I bet John is gonna put them in the chat because he is always really great about that. Um, they are to a video that shows you how to do this and an exact article that goes with the video if you're a reader instead. And the, you, the site, it must be an, it's an Aggie site, I guess, that where you put the percentages in and it says, you have sandy loam or something like that. And it might surprise you, um, some people, I think the guy who made the video said he thought he had clay because it was so compacted, but it turned out it was a sandy, nice sandy loam. It was just, had been terribly compacted. So he would treat it a little bit differently. There are some more vocab here. You ever heard of tilth? Tilth basically means what you think of as good soil. So it's not, you know, effortless to dig into, but you can dig into it. But it also, at the bottom here, it has air pockets. Soil can have like 50% pockets in it and 25% of that can be air, more actually. And it also has aggregates. Aggregates are physical chunks in your soil. So this is a close-up artist's rendering. They're not really that big, but you know, when you break up soil, you see little chunks. So it's not supposed to be a powder I think probably um, some of my neighbors when I was a kid thought they needed to pulverize their soil every spring with the rototiller. And the more powdery it could be in their vegetable garden, the better they felt about it. But soil really does wanna be chunky. Um, it has macropores, the big gaps, that allows moisture to drain, water to drain, but it also has these tiny pores and they hold moisture. So if you've ever seen the tag on a plant and it says, this plant requires moist, well-draining soil. And I think, how does that work? Well, this is how it works is it can hold and drain at the same time. And they're actually, these aggregates are made by fungal mycelia, which are the stringy things that you see. Um, they're also called hyphae um, of fungi and they hold the aggregates together. They also kind of go through the soil and mine the soil and then sometimes share that with plants. And the little red dots are bacteria. They're eating stuff and breaking it down and they make sticky stuff to create little aggregates. Earthworms create aggregates too. Earthworm castings are perfect little aggregates. So what can we do to support that structure in our soil? We can do these things, which some of which you probably already know. Don't walk on your beds dig when your soil is moist, not wet and not bone dry and add some compost. <clears throat> and rather than rototilling the heck out of it, you turn your soil gently and ideally with a fork. If you have a giant garden or a farm, a lot of times people will initially rototill because it, it would just take you three years to dig it with a fork if it were huge. But most gardeners can do it with a, with a fork and even people who do no-till, even farmers who end up doing no-till, they'll initially dig that bed quite deeply and 
they'll just put their amendments on the top. If they're going to lime it, they'll put that compost fertilizer, and then they'll dig that in as deeply as they can um, all at once and as gently as they can. Um, and then that would be the initial setting up of the garden bed. And then after that, you can decide if you want to till your amendments, that means turn gently with the fork, turn your amendments into the top, maybe 10 inches of soil, or maybe do no, no till. But with our clay on Bainbridge, it's doing no till is certainly possible, but you get a better, um, a deeper bed because it's pretty hard to mix that clay um, if you till first, but everybody gets to make their own choices. Does anybody have a question about that? I don't see any questions. Okay. This guy in the picture is doing something that you can do every spring. Some people do it every second year. Some people do it every year. He's got a giant fork called a broad fork, but you can do it with a garden fork. I mentioned this last time. Put the garden fork in as deeply as you possibly can, stand on it, wiggle it back and forth. And when it gets in as far as you can, just pull back and it's gonna lift the bed. And that just lightens those lower levels without breaking up all the aggregates and the fungus and all that. You might, it might crack as you lift it a little bit, but you don't have to like lift it and turn it around. You can dig your soil amendments into the top and then go as deep as you can and lift. Um, in my soil, I have rock about eight inches down, so it's all, it's all the same. I don't get to go that deep. So now you know about the inorganic stuff in your soil, how to maintain that, how to maintain that structure. Another thing that you can do besides preventing soil compaction and understanding what's inorganic in your soil is to get familiar with all of the organisms that um, are running your soil. So here are just a few of them in like an example food web. These bacteria and fungi are going to start to colonize the organic debris and worms and little bugs are going to eat that debris, but they're, they're kind of going after the fungus and the bacteria. It's very enticing to them and they want to eat that. So they then support um, predators. So if you see, I don't know if anybody's seen one of these in their garden, they're usually actually blacker than this in my garden and they're long, they're kind of creepy looking. They're called rove beetles or devil's coach horses, they're called sometimes, or devil's coachmen. I think they look like they are wearing tails. I think that's why. And this is a ground beetle. It's black and it scurries through your garden bed if you have um, plant cover or mulch and they're living under there. One of the things that they can eat is slug eggs. So they're not allowed to eat our plants. I mean, most of the things I see are not eating my plants. And often if they do eat my plants, um, they're also decomposing things. And there are ways for me to discourage them from eating the plants. So then how many of these are in there, in your soil? Think about this, think about a teaspoon of soil and think about how many bacteria do you think are in there? Or how many little nematode worms? They're really tiny nematode worms. So I'm gonna compare it to yogurt. So if this is a teaspoon of yogurt. They're so careful and they try really hard and they manage to get 500 million bacteria per teaspoon. That's what they are very proud of and they, they brag about that, rightly, rightfully. So how does that compare to your soil? Your soil has double that, can have double that in a teaspoon. You can have a billion bacteria in a teaspoon. The median is 500 million, just like cultured yogurt. It goes as low as 100,000, but it can go up to a billion. And with those bacteria in that teaspoon of soil, and by the way, this is the USDA telling us, not somebody who made it up, um, there are feet of fungal mycelia. They're so thin that you can have many feet wrapped around in there. These are visibly large mycelia right here. If you've ever seen those in your garden, it's not like rot, it's not bad rotting. And it, there are several thousand protists or protozoa like amoebas and paramecia in there doing jobs. 
And you can have a couple of dozen nematode worms, some of which are helpful and some of which are sometimes not helpful. Um, this, these are eaten a slug. And the answer to your next question is, no, we can't really support those, those specific ones in our gardens. They're hard to, uh, for these slug eaters, it's hard to maintain them in this, in this climate. Look at this. I don't want you to memorize this, but just scan it and look at the jobs they're doing. Lots of stuff. So I just wanted to impress you with all the things that are going on. And you think it's a slow process, but when the soil warms up, it's a pretty fast process. And they're running cycles. Remember the water cycle, it evaporates and it rains down and it goes through the ground into a pond and then goes back up. Well, all the nutrients cycle. And this is just six of them. So phosphorus, potassium, carbon, nitrogen, everything's going around in these complex cycles. And they're all mediated by those bacteria and fungus and stuff like that. So look at the nitrogen cycle, it's huge. And we can't get any nitrogen without this nitrogen cycle. And they're all running, run. This nitrogen cycle is definitely run by bacteria. In fact, you are, uh, anything that runs your body or is, or is structural is likely to be a protein or protein embedded. So muscles, tendons, ligaments, bones would be like chalk if you didn't have protein. Um, things that run your body, you have tens of thousands of enzymes in your body, and those are almost all proteins. Those, your blood, your eyeballs, your hair, all is heavily made up of protein, and it all requires nitrogen. And right now you're surrounded by 78% nitrogen in the room. You've inhaled it your entire life, and the number of molecules you've incorporated from the air into your body is zero because you don't have access to that nitrogen. There is one kind of organism, one category of organism that can get the nitrogen out of the air and make it in a form that it can go into the body of another organism. And that's soil borne bacteria, either in legumes, which have them in their roots or in the soil itself. They're called nitrogen fixing bacteria and they are the reason that we have protein because they share with the plants and then you know it goes from there. The cow eats it or you eat the plant. So I think that's kind of mind blowing. I think of that when, when people are saying grace, I think, who should I acknowledge for this, uh, you know, this food? Let's see. Okay, so how do we encourage all these bacteria <clears throat> and fungus and little plant animals and things like that. First, do no harm, to quote Hippocrates. Uh, herbicides and pesticides, knock them out. That's pretty common knowledge. Tillage will do it. If you till gently, you do knock some of them out, but not all of them, so they can come back. Um, salty manures, it rains a lot here, so we do lose salts, so it's not a huge problem. But if you use a lot of steer manure over and over and over, you might wanna get a soils test and see if it's too salty or just for nutrient change, you might wanna alternate that with some other stuff like every other year or after five years of you using it, you could switch to another one. Um, and reliance on synthetic fertilizers without, without organic matter. So we can feed the garden organic material. Weirdly, the solution to clay not draining well is add organic material. And the solution to um, sand draining too much is add organic material. I think that's pretty cool. Um, and of course, you'd know it would improve the air in the soil and store nutrients and feed everybody. So that is what we're looking to do. I'm gonna actually skip this one. Let's talk about fertilizers. So fertilizers, quick quick reminder, this is every fertilizer bag is supposed to have these numbers on it. It's always nitrogen and then phosphorus and then potassium. Potassium can be called potash and 
phosphorus can be called phosphate. Um, these two, remember I said positive stuff likes to stick to the soil? These two are positively charged. So they stick around. So they can actually build up if we keep using um, AP fertilizer that's balanced every year, they can build up in the soil, it's possible. And we'll talk about that when we talk about why you might wanna get a soil test. But nitrogen is a slippery little devil. Nitrogen has two things that are strange about it. It's negatively charged, couldn't care less about sticking to the soil. So when it rains here like crazy all winter, it can rinse right out. It hits whatever hardest surface is below your garden, flows down to your neighbors, goes into the ditches, goes into the sound. Um, so ideally we actually won't have much nitrogen um, if we're not using the bed over winter because it's just gonna rinse out. But um, another thing about nitrogen is that it is a gas in its pure form, it's a gas at room temp. So it will just float out into the air. So thanks nitrogen. So how can we keep our nitrogen around? We can, of course, incorporate organic matter. It makes it sound like I want you to put tons of organic matter in. You don't need tons, you just need some. And all of these things are fairly expected. Don't till more than you have to because every time you um, till, you stimulate extra bacterial activity and they're gonna use, break down more of the carbon in the soil because they're getting more air, you know, like turning your compost pile. Um, and then they use up the carbon and they use nitrogen in order to eat the carbon. You can add your nitrogen in the spring rather than fall unless you're using raw manure. If you're ask, using raw manure, ask me at question time or at the end, because um, there are a few extra slides that I'd like to show you, or you can email me or something. So uncomposted manure is what I'm talking about. But many national publications say, when you put your beds to bed for the winter, dig in your soil amendments and your fertilizer so that it has time to break down over the winter but those are dry places. Those are not places where it rains all the time. So here, it's good to put it in the spring because you're gonna lose it if you don't and it creates water pollution. The next one says, give plants nitrogen before they'll need to grow leaves and shoots and not before fruiting. So tomatoes are very hungry plants, for example. So when I put them in, I'm not gonna give them a teaspoon of fertilizer right at the bottom of the planting hole below the tiny plant. I'm gonna amend a bed for them that's out around them so that I know their roots are gonna get there pretty quickly and they're gonna eat. So I do want nitrogen in there and phosphorus and all that stuff, calcium. But once they start fruiting, once they have um, grown into a big plant, I don't wanna side dress them. Can you still hear me? Okay. Yes. yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, so we don't wanna side dress our tomato plants with more nitrogen because nitrogen, nitrogen um, is gonna encourage more green growth. It's like saying to our tomato plants um, halfway through, you know, they grow into a big plant. And if we side dress them once they're big plants and we put nitrogen around them, we're gonna say, go ahead, you're, in, you're immortal. You don't need to think about reproduction. And we actually want them to feel like they maybe it's time to make some babies and they'll make some tomatoes for us. So that's for a plant where I want it to fruit. I did fertilize it really well. I am generous with it, but I'm not gonna side dress with more nitrogen uh, in like July. On the other hand, with my kale, I do want it to feel immortal. I don't want it to bolt. That means make flowers. I want it to just keep growing. So I'm going to give it maybe balanced fertilizer when I plant it in the whole area where I expect the roots to grow. And then about July, I don't want it to think life is getting tough and hot and I'm running out of nitrogen. So I might side dress that, that means scratch a little bit of a nitrogen fertilizer around in the soil around it. 
that's one thing that says it's still spring to this plant. I'm gonna make sure it gets watered adequately. That's another thing that says, don't worry, keep growing leaves. And I'm gonna keep the soil cool and evenly moist. So I'm gonna put chopped leaves or straw around it. So that includes, that encourages it to keep growing leaves. I grow my chard, my kale rather for the whole year. I just plant it once and then it just keeps going. It does get really tall and look like something Dr. Seuss drew, but it's still good. Um, the next thing says dig high nitrogen amendments into the soil and don't leave them on top. The reason we wanna do that is that nitrogen can float away. And um, for manure, like if you put fresh manure on the surface of the soil, it's quite high nitrogen. And if you leave it there without either covering it up with compost, that would be like a no-till method, or turning it in gently into the soil. If you just leave it there, you can lose half the nitrogen in it within 12 hours. So it's really good to turn that in. Um, some people put it on and they just say, I don't care, I'm gonna lose that nitrogen. Um, you can mulch your beds and you can consider cover crops. And I'll tell you what cover crops are in the future. Um, Fran asks, I use chicken manure pellets dug into the soil and put my compost on top. Does that make any sense? Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. In your eventually your um, compost will make its way into the soil because of just um, organisms in the soil. Um, and you're mulching, I think you're, you're saving nutrients. Um, you're saving, sorry, you're saving moisture, right? By mulching with your compost. If you dig it in, it does make it more accessible. You could like dig some in and put some on top. Um, so you get more nutrients out of it if you put it in the soil, but it'll make its way in eventually anyway. I'm These are, oh. That's yeah, good. and I bet I. Well, uh, I don't know what they're doing or whether they're drinking wine. No, no, no. There, he sent me a. <laughs> okay. And Fran, if you can hear me still, um, I do want you to tell us about your peas in a little bit. I was going to do that at the beginning, but um, yeah, but we can do it in a little while. So yes, I hear you. These... Sorry, Fran. Yes, I can hear you. I'd be glad to tell about my peas. <laughs> okay, remind me about it. I have a, like, I even have your picture at the beginning of the class, but I wasn't, I had to go on. So um, here is a little chart about mulches. It's pretty basic, um, but you can see that some of them say lifespan one season. And uh, we should, on our gardens, we should use things that break down if we're gonna dig them into the garden like wood chips, for example, if you keep digging wood chips in, they don't really break down very quickly. Some wood chips are fine, you know, like that are in your compost, but a lot of doing that creates a lot of um, surface area that steals nitrogen. So it's nice to have mulch that breaks down. So you can use straw. This is actually a mistake. Straw is not harvested before seed heads emerge. It's harvested after the seed heads are cut off, but hay breaks down. But you know what's really great around here is just, we have just so many leaves. And the park, I called the parks department and I said, as long as I'm not taking them out of the forest, but I'm taking them off the lawn at like Waterfront Park or Battle Point, can I just take the leaves? And they said, lady, I'll show you the trees I have, am responsible for. You rake where I am supposed to rake. So they're very glad to have you do it. And this sounds ridiculous, but I really think that you should try it. I have taken my electric mower to Waterfront Park and taken all the leaves and sucked them up with my mower, just mowed around into the, the bag, you know, the collection bag, put it in the back of a truck and then put my mower back in the truck and left. I borrowed the truck and I think you could do it. Get a friend who's got a truck, get another one who's got an electric battery powered mower and you'll be the one who has the ideas. You'll be the idea person and you can all lift things into the truck together. You can get a lot of um, leaves that way. And chop leaves are good because A, they don't laminate. Sometimes they laminate so the water can't get in, which isn't a problem in winter, but um, if you're mulching in the spring, they'll, the big leaves will stick. 
but chopped leaves are jumbled and they let the water in better. And they also don't blow away in the, in the wind so much. Does anybody have any questions? I, I bet you'd put them in the chat if you did. But I'm just inviting. Okay. So this chart right here um, is one of so many great tables that are in a book that I'm going to recommend because the next stuff you see um, refers to this book a lot. I checked out lots of books from the Kitsap Regional Library, which I highly recommend, um, to make sure that this was still my favorite soil building book. It is still my favorite. It is so accessible. It's really accessible. And the front half is like this talk. It's about like the big picture organic systems. And the back half guides you step by step through like what you're supposed to do and even the scary parts of a soil test if you're not a math person. Um, so it's really great. So in the chat will soon appear and in the resource page that you'll get access to, I have maybe five links. One of them is to get up regional libraries and four are to local uh, booksellers um, who are selling this book. And Kitsap has three copies. And I'm proud of myself that they are actually links to the pages for this book. So all you have to do to get it is get your library card or your credit card, whichever you choose. And um, I'm not paid by this person, but I use so much of her material that I really think it's a great book to have. And if you got it from the library, you could just photocopy all your favorite charts. Um, yeah, let me think. Yeah. So hopefully that will show up. And if your local bookseller is not one that I listed, um, just call them. I just listed the ones that have them um, available online right now. They have a service where you can order through them online. Love the book. So the next thing you can do, besides all the things I've listed, holding on to your nitrogen, understanding your soil structure, you can try consider cover crops so cover crops are really cool so, so they are planted specifically be, like to make yourself some growing compost now you might think oh, i get my compost from everywhere anywhere but if you have empty beds in the winter and you grow them they will suppress weeds and every time you pull a weed out and throw it in the green waste that weed um, is stealing nutrients from your soil because it's made of the nutrients that were in your soil. So that's why I refer to soil mining there. Um, you can put your weeds back in if they don't have runner roots or roots that will, you know, create new plants or they don't have seeds. You can turn them in. Um, the cover crop will also hold the nitrogen that's in your soil. So let's say you did want to put a nitrogen amendment in in the winter or you you ended up thinking oh i put a lot of nitrogen in these beds and i don't want it to rinse out and i think i have nitrogen left in there you can plant a crop and even if you're not growing anything in that bed then that crop will suck up the nitrogen and hold it in its body and then you go and you kill that crop later when you're ready to plant you kill that crop and you turn it under and that nitrogen has been held on to, but it's being re-released in your soil. And plus it's not just hold, held the nitrogen, it's made organic carbon material like sugars and fibers and stuff that are gonna feed your soil. So you might think, well, it's just from the soil and it's just going back in the soil. Isn't that a zero sum thing? Mm -mm, because the plant has been doing photosynthesis. So it's made all these carbon-based sugars and starches and fibers and things like that that were not in the soil before and if you get legumes this last word down here legumes peas beans vetch clover and alfalfa although alfalfa i think is a perennial so i wouldn't use it um, they do that but they also have those nitrogen fixing bacteria in their roots so they're actually going to pull nitrogen out of the air as well so they will actually increase the nitrogen as though you had fertilized. So you might think, well, I don't want that because it'll wash out in the winter. But if you're growing them in the winter, this picture here is um, Austrian field peas. 
If you're growing them in the winter, they're not letting go of that nitrogen that they're making. It's in their bodies. One thing that they don't do is you'll sometimes hear someone say, someone, someone say, plant this, it will put calcium into your soil. They can't do that. They can't put calcium and magnesium. I think people are thinking of if you had a really deep taproot, it could get down to the subsoil and pull nutrients out of there and then bring it up. And trees do that. So that's why we love tree leaves because trees pull from really deep and then they drop their minerally leaves around. So how do you use cover crop? You buy some. Uh, Bay has got um, a few tubs, like eight kinds of cover crops. Um, I don't know if Bainbridge Gardens has has tubs of them. You can order online, but often you have to get a lot. And then you seed, you sprinkle it at the recommended rate, either underneath your plants or between, or when the plants are out, you can put them in. Because some of them are really good at growing in the autumn, for example. And water them like a crop, and then they're going to grow. Buckwheat can grow, like it can start to flower in a month, um, probably five weeks. And um, so that's a really fast one. But uh, Austrian field peas, you can have growing all winter. So buckwheat's a warm weather crop and super fast. So you can, it just depends on what your timing, what timing you want. And um, Fran says she got Austrian field peas from Behe. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, they have really nice ones. Maybe you can tell us about your experience with that uh, right after this slide, if you want to, Fran. Um, and then you're going to look for right when they're gonna flower, like the first flower bud you see, or maybe even before. And you go out there with either your string trimmer, your loud string trimmer, or a hori hori knife, those big garden knives, or your giant bread knife from home. And you grab them by their necks and you cut them off at the soil level. And then you chop them up with a sharp shovel. And then you shove your shovel about three or four inches underneath the soil, like kind of flat and you scoop them up and pancake, turn them over. You wanna dig it into the soil. So we want it to be green and lush. We don't want it to start to form flowers and seeds because that uh, reduces the nitrogen that's in the plants um, and also can cause you to have seeds, you know, more, more growing than you want. Yeah, so then you let it rot for a little while. So you'll hear everything from, um, a week or two in warm weather to you know five or six weeks when it's cooler depends on how much you want it to break down um, apparently it doesn't have to break down all the way for us to plant in it but so we could still see some of it in the soil as long as it was really green when you put it under um, you can you can plant before it's completely broken down and which one you get depends on what you need do you want nitrogen? Do you want it to grow in the winter? Do you want it to grow in the summer? If you're new to this, I say choose an annual. So whatever you're picking up, ask the staff, is this an annual, especially with clovers, because you can get perennials, because perennials are so hard to kill. So you want to consult a guide to choose. And this guide is right next to the bins at Behe. And I'm sure they have this at um, Bainbridge Gardens and other nurseries around Kitsap County. Um, it kind of looks like there's too much information here, but let's look at buckwheat down here, planted after the last frost. It's a warm weather thing. It tells you how much per a thousand feet. So you can do some math and figure out what it, what it should be for your particular garden. It doesn't fix nitrogen. See this right here, legume nitrogen source? These all fix nitrogen. That means they'll increase the nitrogen in your soil and it tells you how good they are at that. But these will hold, hold nitrogen for you or just create uh, organic matter for your soil. Fran, do you wanna tell us about uh, your field peas? How was your experience of growing them? Yeah, I'm just looking at my diary because I write down stuff. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, so, um, right. Uh, well, what I do is I, I plant the field, I plant the cover crop after, in the fall, late mm -hmm. fall, after I have 
cleaned everything out. So uh -huh. when I harvested all my um, tomatoes and stuff. Uh, so I, I have notes here. I planted my cover crop on October 19th. That's um, great that you have those notes. Yeah. So that that's, I think, a little bit late, just in terms of getting the cover crop going. And my cover crop uh -huh. never got <laughs> anywhere near as bushy as what you showed in your picture. But, you know, it, it got uh, probably two or three inches high. Mm -hmm. And wasn't very really dense um mm -hmm. but you know it it i think sort of did the job and uh, mm -hmm. and then i turned it over um in, in the you know not long ago um okay where um yeah um Well, I guess about February 25th, I really got going on preparing my beds. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when I, you know, got my, got my compost um, from uh, tilts and uh, uh, spread out my, my chicken pellets. Um, uh, uh, on top of the soil and then put the compost on top um, having having turned the the cover crops right well that sounds great yeah everything you, in my garden is fine fine oh that's good yeah that's great really cool huh thank you and you didn't have to cut it because it was fairly short Right. You just turned okay. it over. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Are you going to do it again this year? Will I plant a cover crop in the fall? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Austrian field peas probably again. They seem to work. <laughs> yeah. And why not? Because you have to cover it with something or you're going to get a lot of weeds, right? Well, I do different things in different beds. So I have a pea patch and I have these mm -hmm. four by fours. And I did cover crops in three. But mm -hmm. then I have a, a bed that's mostly uh, dahlias, mm -hmm. and they've got these stalks sticking up and everything. Sure, yeah. So I do cardboard there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I did yeah. cardboard in another. Oh well, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I do a lot of leaves and a lot of other things too. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's neat. A little personal experience with cover crops. Okay, so something else you might want to consider. I just want to gently consider, suggest you might want to do this every few years. Consider a soil test. Um, for organic gardeners, we should know that soil tests were invented for synthetic fertilizers. So they measure the fluid stuff, the solution, the nutrients in solution, but we can still use them. They kind of need to catch up to what's going on for organic gardeners but um, we can use them. If we see, if the results of the soil test tell us we are slightly um, short, like we are just not slightly short, short of ideal nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium, it's possible that we still have it. It just hasn't been released yet this season because it's in organic matter in our soil. But they're good for detecting severe deficiencies or you know, quite pronounced deficiencies and for detecting excesses. If it tells you you have too much phosphorus, you probably do. So that's pretty handy, especially since phosphorus and potassium can build up. They'll definitely tell you your pH of your soil. So vegetables like a close to neutral pH, just, just slightly acidic from neutral. And pH is, if, is, it, is it more like lemon juice or is it more like baking soda? So that's more acid or more base. And um, they'll even give you recommendations for what to add to the soil. And there are lots of places to get these tests. Um, Kitsap Conservation District uses ANL labs and I'm gonna show you a sample of how, what it looks like to get uh, those forms and things. Um, but there are lots of them. There's one locally um, that does a lot of like 
um, soils engineering kind of testing and they do a soils test. It's $150. I'm not sure how it's different now. I know before I, I used it 15 years ago, probably. Um, and I'm not sure why it's 150, but just be aware that um, other labs can, can um, charge less. Um, you have to get samples of your soil out of your garden and mix them together and put them in a box and mail it to them. And when a &L gives the instructions for how to do that, they talk to you like you're a farmer for some reason. They know they've got um, gardeners. So they may have a new form, but even a few weeks ago, they hadn't yet produced it, I think. And the form that they sent me said, take 50 samples out of your field and make sure it's no closer than 50 yards from any building or road. And I thought, nobody gardens like that. I need the home gardener version. So the home gardener version um, is on the resource page. It's how to sample, how to take samples from your garden. It's a little video. And she shows you how to go around your garden and get samples and mix them together in a bucket. You're supposed to use something that's stainless steel. I think she uses a plastic cup. <clears throat> they just don't want iron from your, um, from like your rusty hoe, your rusty shovel. So I've used a kitchen spoon, like a cooking spoon that's really sturdy. Um, but, um, oh, she also puts it in a little box because she's only mailing a pound of it. But a &L recently got all new, like fancy lab equipment and they're not charging us anymore, but they do want three pounds of our soil now. So you take these samples in various places in your garden and mix them together. And you can do more than one test if you want. So first I'm gonna address why would you wanna do a test instead of just like keep adding balanced organic fertilizer that's like 555 or 643 or whatever. Well, it's possible that you could build up phosphorus. And one of the things that happens when that happens is here's a root in this picture and it has secreted food that attracts this fungus. And the fungus is helping the root get nutrients and withstand water stress. And if you have a lot of phosphorus, you can inhibit those fungi. If you have a lot of potassium, you can get this false calcium deficiency because the potassium blocks the calcium from being absorbed. And um, you can get salt built up in your soil, in theory anyway, around here, it's so rainy, I don't know if we do. So first scary page, if you, if you are concerned about this, um, this is the fee schedule, okay? It's $25 for the simple one. This is acid base. This is your phosphorus stuff, nothing to be afraid of there. This is the name of the test they used. I don't care. Here's potassium. Here's cation exchange capacity. It means how many negative sur surfaces do you have in your soil that positive stuff could stick to. And this is calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, and then OM is organic matter. They, this is loss on ignition. They light your soil on fire and they see how much weight it loses after the organic matter burnt off. Here's your nitrogen stuff and here's your sulfur stuff. Sulfur is also negative, so it kind of does what nitrogen does by escaping. If you were ever, um, you know your pH is perfect and you're doing your absolute best with your soil and you just can't grow beets to save your life, you might be interested in boron. Beets need boron, we have a little deficiency here, but the thing is, the difference between enough boron and poisoning your garden bed forever is like the difference between a teaspoon of boron and a tablespoon. I mean, it's you, you, want, you want numbers if you're gonna put boron on. So it sounds scary, but I have done it because a soil test told me to. And I did my little half teaspoon and a lot of water and then I distributed it and it solved my problem. So I'm just saying you can get a different test and sometimes that's quite useful. So here's this um, daunting form. You just fill out what you can. So I'm gonna make up a sample ID. I'm gonna do V-E-G-I-S for my veg bed and B-L-U-E-S because it's blueberries and blueberries in my other bed is blueberries. And they need super different things. So I'm not mixing my soils. Vegetables need a very different pH from blueberries, for example. And blueberries take up a different form of nitrogen. Blueberries, if you're treating your blueberries 
like your vegetables, same fertilizer, same compost, and they're not thriving for you, that might be why. You might want to request we talk about fruit sometime. I'm not a total expert, but I know about that. And then they're going to ask you, like, what's the crop? So I'm going to write veggies and blueberries and tell them some other things here. And then you're going to choose up here pounds per thousand square feet because you can adjust that to the to the more easily to the um, the area of your garden. And you're going to get a plastic bag and put the soil in it according to the instructions in the video. And then you're going to put it inside of a box and then you're going to mail it to them. And they will send you this. Thank goodness for graphs because I can immediately see that manganese is super high. This is just an example, it's not mine. And they tell you how much of each thing you have. This is not very meaningful to me. I don't know these numbers. You know, I don't know if that's high boron or low, but thank goodness they can tell me. But down here, they're giving me recommendations for how much to apply. And this is per acre for a farm, so it, the numbers are really big. Look, this is half a pound. This is like a cup of boron for an entire acre. So that's how careful we are. And they're gonna give you two pH readings. And what they recommend for lime is dependent on your pH. The buffer pH considers the texture of your soil, like how much holding capacity does it have? Is it clay with a lot or is it sand with not, without much? So their recommendations are gonna be based on this. And if you're doing any kind of calculations, you probably are gonna be using that number. And then down here, they give you ideas for where you can get that. Now there's a little math that you need to do because the pounds of nitrogen does not mean go get a bag of fertilizer. Organic fertilizer is gonna have a lot of stuff in it, right? So to get a hundred pounds of nitrogen, this farmer is going to do a little tiny bit of math. It's not hard. It's dividing two numbers. It's dividing this number basically by the number on the fertilizer bag. Um, as a percent number though. So I could certainly show you how to do that, but these guys, there are a couple of sources for, to lead you through what to do and how you figure out how much fertilizer you're gonna put on. This is a great start for reading. And let me see if I have, it's a great book that can lead you through it. The back of the book leads you through it. I'm gonna go see if I can get this, these people, there's a link on the resource page. They are amazing. They are a collaboration of a lot of organizations in Seattle. And you can email them your soil test. And then they will get on the phone with you and they will walk you through all of it. We'll exactly turn it into what you should do, which is pretty amazing. And they are there most of the time when I call them and they are really expert when I talk to them. It's really great. And you can ask them a lot of questions. They seem to have quite a deep knowledge. And what about pH? This is the availability of different nutrients at various pHs. And you can see that at 6.5, a lot of them are available. So veggies like that slightly acidic, you know, the, a lot of vegetables can tolerate a little above seven down this way, but they like this area. I'm not, I don't remember what this ideal range was ideal for. Um, I don't remember, yeah, what the source of this was, which I should have written down, but I didn't. Anyway, they like it. Uh, they can tolerate like beets like 6.4 to 6.8. So that is why we care about pH. Um, blueberries like pH way down here because they can't even take up the kind of nitrogen they like without having low pH. Let me think. Yeah, and what we do to manipulate pH, we tend to have um, acidic leaning soil. And so we add lime typically. There's a really finely powdered lime that you should wear a mask with if you're using it, but it acts faster. It's called ag lime, ground ag lime, agricultural lime. And there are, there's a chunkier lime that's slow, but it doesn't get dusty. 
And then there's another kind, I think it's called super sweet. It's been ground up, but then it's been re-kibbled, like stuck together so that it acts like the coarse lime, but it falls apart and acts quickly like the fine lime. But that was kind of cool. Let me see where we go in here. Oh, does anybody want to see? You want to see this? Give me a yay or a nay. Actually, this is in that book. A lot of these, every chart you see that looks like this is in the, the building soil book. You can see that if you needed some nitrogen in the middle of the summer to keep something going, you could use blood meal. If you're a carnivore, you're using a slaughterhouse product that came from the same place that your meat came from. And you can use bone meal if you need phosphorus. Um, there are uh, non-animal sources too. There's cottonseed meal. Um, I don't see cottonseed meal available in our stores locally very much, but I think you can order it or you can call around and see what they have. It can contain pesticides because cotton's a very pesticide heavy uh, crop, but you can get um, it without pesticides. It tends to acidify the soil slightly, but you're gonna eventually get yourself a pH test, right? A, a soils test maybe to see if it's causing too much acidification. You can get soybean meal. Oddly, you can't get cottonseed meal, which I think would be really common, but you can get bat guano. Um, you have to watch if you're gonna use bat guano, there are two things. There are some bat guanos, for, these are, if they eat bugs, it has a lot of nitrogen, but if they eat fruit, it has a lot of phosphorus and not that much nitrogen. Also, it's mined off the bottom of bat caves and it is a unique ecosystem that is supporting, supported by that guano. So you have to look over here for all your moral decisions about what, what amendment to use. So that is some stuff about soil. And let me think. Yeah, when we come back, I think, I think we'll take a really quick break. And when we come back, um, we'll hear about Fran's results with her pea starts that she bought and pulled apart. And we'll talk about what you're interested in, in terms of what to plant now, what crops you're curious about, what you have trouble with, what you'd like to study in the next few uh, classes. And and we'll um, hear more about other questions. Okay, so John, can we do five minutes? You bet, five minutes, I'll start the timer right now. Okay, thank you. That's five minutes. Okay, we're back. Yay. <clears throat> so this list is basically just reminders of things I want to ask you. Uh, right after I make sure that you don't have more questions about, sorry, about soil. Does anybody have questions, anything you'd like, like you want to know what is in various manures or anything like that? Or John, did I miss any questions? Fran has one in there about blood meal. Oh yeah, of course. No, blood meals, there's no problem with blood meal. It's very high nitrogen. So it's going to increase, um, you know, the, the leaf, and sh leaf and shoot growth. So I guess if you were dumping it around something that you wanted to have fruiting, you might, um, you might not get as much fruiting because you're convincing that it, it that it should just grow vegetatively. And you could have runoff if you're using a lot of it. You could have runoff into, um, you know, into the groundwater. So those are my downsides for blood meal. Right. Yeah. Does anybody have? Um, any experience with soil that you want to talk about? Anything that you think really worked well for you? 
Like, does anybody use fresh manure and it's just brilliant? No, I meant brilliant in its effect, not it brilliant in its odor. Well, I'd be interested in anybody's views about the various things you can get at tilts. So there's Bainbridge Bounty, there's um, the fish. Oily fish? Yeah, oily fish, right, exactly. Does anybody have experience with those? I've used oily fish and it's great. Um, it's super expensive. It, I mean, for a compost, it's very expensive, but it's very high quality. So I quite like it. And you can go to Tills. You do not have to get a yard from Tills. You can buy it by the bucket. I think yep. I already mentioned that. I, I think when I get 10 buckets, I think it is, I'd have to check the math on that, but I think it's 10 buckets is a quarter yard, 10 five gallon buckets. And when they charge me for the quarter yard, it's much lower than the price for um, that many buckets. Like they have a bucket price. So I don't wanna, um, I wanna be fair to everyone, um, but if somebody's really um, feeling that you wanna save money, you might get 10 buckets full and just say, I'm getting a quarter yard. So have, has anybody else used Oli Fish? Yeah. It's just a compost. Yeah, you like it, Fran? Yes, usually I get Bainbridge Bounty, but mm -hmm. they didn't actually have it available when I went uh, in February. And so I got the oily fish and that's what's on my beds now. And of course, I, as I say, I have a pea patch, so I don't have vast areas. Mm -hmm. so I, do, I do buckets. I got eight buckets. And of course, the thing I like about it is there's no plastic. Yes. So I bring my yeah. bucket. I dump them out. There's no plastic. And I see my neighbors with their big plastic compost. More plastic thing. and more plastic. And I'm like, no, right. just go to tilts. Right. Yeah. And uh, and I think people think they need to have a truck to do it. But do you put it in the back of your car? Of course. I have a yeah. Honda. I have a Honda yeah. stick. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I'm always pulling in there in my car and they say, yeah. that's not going to fit. I say, just watch me. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, a lot of stuff can go in our cars. Right. Right. Um, well, um, oh, Fran, why don't you tell us about your peas? Sure. Well, so I, I don't have the patience to plant from seed. So I buy starts. And of course, the trick is to make the starts uh, not horrendously expensive. So, for example, with the peas, you know, I got one little uh um container three and a half by three and a half and it has eight peas in it right they're kind of clustered so i very very gently well at first i i take all of the soil with the peas out of the container and then i very very gently pry them apart really really gently and then I'll get, you know, a pea with its root dangling down and I make the hole and I dangle that root down into that hole and then shove the soil around that root. And I, I did this with two different containers. So I have about 16 peas and they're all thriving, every one of them. So it works. You Good can, to know. You can separate those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I had said brassicas and some other things do that really well, but I wasn't sure about peas because they have kind of brutal roots. But that's nice to know it works. That's great. Yeah, and of course I do it with the lettuce and the spinach and all, mm -hmm. all my things because I, I use starts. Yeah, it's also nice to know how you garden, Fran, to hear. <laughs> we should probably start to meet um, individuals in the group and have them tell a little bit about themselves. Right. Um, so. Uh, gradually. Uh, so um, does anybody want to talk about, well, let's look at the calendar. Let's look at the West Side Gardeners calendar right here for April. Now there's a lot on there and I'm not starting my eggplant. I am going to buy starts of eggplant, but um, you can continue to do that succession sowing we've talked about for a salad veg. 
and they are pretty tolerant of this cool weather now, especially it snowed this afternoon. It, did it snow at your house, anybody? It snowed here. Um, are you eating? Okay, it says try eating kale blossoms. I hope if you haven't pulled your kale out yet, I hope you leave it there because I hope we all know, maybe there are some people who are from like Rochelle, are you from Colorado? Is that what you told me? Um, no, um, Bay oh. Area. Oh, okay. And did you eat kale blossoms? Have you eaten kale blossoms your whole life? Or are you? Uh, no, you I, have, I have never had a kale blossom. Well, you can leave your kale and you think it's doing nothing over the winter. You know, you can eat the leaves off and then it will start to produce little tiny broccolis. Um, they don't even look like broccoli. They're really skinny, but you can pull them all off and pull the leaves off and you can keep eating it. And um, you can toss those little blossom stems um, and blossom. You pull them off before they bloom and you can toss them in garlic and salt and olive oil and then roast them really hot in the oven and they're delicious. So uh, they usually happen in April. There's a variety you can get that doesn't do it until May. And um, has anybody not sown peas yet? Or you don't plan, if you don't plan to sow them, it's no big deal. But if you haven't sown your peas yet, you can do it, but they're gonna mature when it's hot. So it's good to get an enation resistant variety. Enation's a virus that makes them have these little like pimples on them and they don't grow quite as well. So if you're gonna grow those, and um, Cascadia, I think, is nation resistant. I can look that up if you want. I have a question. Yeah. Um, uh, so I do have is that my- you, Mary Lou? Yes, it is Mary Lou. Um, my peas mm -hmm. are coming up, just coming up. Mm -hmm. um, and so should I sow a second, do a second sowing? So I have longer time or is this gonna be it? Oh, no, you can sew again. You want to use, you can, I would do it immediately. Okay. Um, and you can sew again, and you probably want a nation resistant variety. Okay. And mm -hmm. yeah. And they take a long time to, to bear. Sometimes they're not bearing until June anyway. Yeah. Okay. And Mary Lou, did you get my information about growing in the shade? <laughs> um, I did. You, did you send it to me separately? Yeah, I did. Because okay. you were asking that, about growing in the shade, right? Well, growing in not as much sun as I not think as I, much sun. Yeah, <laughs> I have on the resource page. I have an article about growing in the sun, and I did send it to you in an email as well. Yeah, good. Then I then yeah. I have it. So, so anybody okay. who's interested in growing in like four hours of sun, five hours, and you think, oh, I can't do it, it's worth, it's worth an experiment. You'll, you'll find out whether or not you can. And there's specifically an article on the resource page about someone who does it and has tips for like what you grow and things like that. Okay, good. Thank you. And yeah. also, do you use the covers on that more often then just to keep it warmer? The, the closure? Um, I think... Uh, I would probably not do that because the cloches themselves, it, if they're the ones that are covered in plastic, are going to reduce the light a little bit. Okay. So I would try, you know, if it's hailing on them, I'd probably put a cloche on, but um, they might, they'll, they're pretty tolerant. And peas especially are really cold tolerant. Okay. Um, but since you're kind of having to choose between light and um, light and warmth, in your case, you don't have as much light. I would probably choose for light, although you can experiment with that and find out. Now, nope. do you have do you have um, deciduous trees? So you're getting light at this time of year. Um, I I I'm on two and a half acres, but the property is, is surrounded by fir, mm -hmm. and so and so I have deciduous to my south, um, and then oh, I good. and and. Uh, and, but then the sun has to come up above the fur on the far property yeah, line. Yeah, it's those tubes of light that we get from these tall, tall trees. We have just a few hours in that, yeah. in that gap, right? Yeah. 
so it does get hot it, it can get mm -hmm. hot but, it doesn't, but the, the hours of sun is not necessarily long and then right. after a point it hits then i have trees to the west um mm -hmm. and so yeah so it's somewhat limited right thank you that's interesting and in, i'd be interested to see what happens with your with your gardening in a few hours of sun all right um, thank you here yeah he says in this calendar, he says, start your basil inside around the 15th. I usually do it a little bit later than that. And then I keep it under growing under a cloche in the garden for a lot of the time. Like I put the cloche on in the late afternoon, like the last hour of sun, even in the summer so that it stays warm overnight. And then I wait until the sun is hitting it to take the cloche off. So I wouldn't put your, don't put your basil out. Uh, too soon and keep it really warm because it'll turn black if it goes below 50. Um, and another thing is this, um, this particular calendar says now is a good time to plant bulb onions. I think if I were growing them from seed, I would have planted them inside in January to get really good growth um, because onions need a super long season. But there are a couple other ways to plant bulb onions. You could go his way and do it from seed that he, he's successful with that. Um, you can also get sets. Sets are teeny tiny onions and you put them so that um, they're only about an inch deep. So the top of the onion tiny bulb is sticking up. Sets are an easy way to grow onions. They won't be as large as they would if you grew them from seed or plants, which is the next thing I'll talk about. Um, but they are, they're an easy way to do some onions. They make great green onions. Um, I would go to one of your local stores. Um, you have to, you can't use them from the produce department because they have something called sprout nip on them that keeps them from sprouting often. But you can go to get them from, in, in bulk from a lot of nursery centers. And if you want to grow them as green onions, which is a satisfying thing to do because they're fast, um, you would plant them deeper, like a couple of inches deep so that you get that longer shaft of a green onion. And by fast, I don't mean one month, but um, if you try to grow them to bulb onions, you aren't going to get them until like August, September, maybe. Um, so green onions are faster. And it's nice not to buy a whole bunch of green onions and then have half of them decay in the fridge because you're just using a little bit. And if they're in your garden and you keep a constant supply in your garden, which you can do pretty much all year, um, then you just go out because you need two green onions. You just go out there and take a couple or go by your pea patch on the way home from work. Um, another way to grow onions is to use plants and they're sold in bundles. Let's see if I can get a picture. So these are bundles of onion plants and they look a mess, they look a wreck, but they're very resilient. They're super good at growing their roots back. So these are bundled together and you can find them at local nurseries in maybe April, May, maybe probably April. Um, and then you just barely put them in the ground. They're like, you put them in like an inch into the ground because the onion grows quite near the surface and on the surface and you have it way down under, it doesn't grow as well. And something to know about onions is onions are not roots. The root of the onion and the garlic and the shallot are all that stringy stuff on the bottom. Onions and garlic and stuff are swollen leaf bases and leaves need nitrogen. So they're very heavy nitrogen feeders, all of those. So in fact, if you overwinter garlic, which is how we plant it here, we do fertilize the bed, say in October, we fertilize a bed and we plant the cloves a couple of inches down and then we mulch it and we leave it and it grows a bit and comes up through the mulch, the leaf mulch maybe. And then when we see daffodils grow, sprouting or rather flowering, we remember that it's time to side dress the garlic. So we pull the mulch back 
and we um, apply nitrogen fertilizer like blood meal, if that's your thing, or cottonseed meal um, around it, or fish emulsion. And we scratch it into the surface of the soil, like the top inch or so of, of soil around them, and it makes them more successful growers. Blood meal is super concentrated, so you hardly need any, by the way. Do you see anything else on this list that makes you interested in asking me a question? Usually I just barrel through two hours of talking and I thought, let's give a little bit more time to hear from you. Oh, don't put your tomatoes out. People get excited about getting tomatoes and sometimes the tomatoes show up in the nurseries. And if we have a really cold spring, we have to hold those tomatoes for a long time before it's safe to put them out. So you might end up having to pot your tomato up into a bigger container. That might be a good idea. Um, and then you can put it out when it's sunny and bring it in when it, the temperatures drop overnight or you can keep it under a cloche or something like that. Oh, talk about growing carrots. Thank you, Ruth Adams. Okay, let's talk about growing carrots. I have, I'm gonna stop sharing just for a sec so I can find my carrot page. So your carrots are stunted, Ruth says. My carrots are always stunted. I can relate. Thank you for making a suggestion, Ruth. Okay, so this is just a big long list of all the thoughts I had about carrots. Okay, Ruth, do your carrots ever have this kind of stuff on them? I'm not seeing the chat now, so I can't tell. Yeah, they do. Okay, so they have that. Okay, this is carrot rust fly. So it is a fly that can smell your carrots. How menacing does that sound? And it flies in and it lays eggs in the soil near the carrots. And then the little eggs hatch and they crawl over and they eat your carrots. Super pop, super common in west of the Cascades. So something that you can do about that is use agricultural fabric. Are you familiar with Rime? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it looks like tissue paper, but it's made of spun poly. It's made of plastic, I'm sorry. But it'll last a few years if you are careful with it. And you can get a really light version called Agrabon 15, I think, or Rime summer cover. It's very thin, so it lets a lot of light in and it lets water, you can water straight through it. So, um, I'm gonna run through this whole thing of what you do with carrots, this whole list. So start with the deepest bed you have. If you have a raised bed or even a really giant pot and you want just one season of satisfactory carrots, that's a great place to put them if you're tired of getting small carrots. So you start with the deepest, you know, most homogenous bed you can. And don't add a lot of nitrogen. You can add a little all-purpose fertilizer, but you don't wanna dump like a lot of blood meal on there because the carrots will grow a lot of tops. And are your carrots ever hairy? Like they have all those tiny roots all over? I, I think they do every, every single thing you're gonna mention. Oh, okay, yeah. At some point. Well, you know what? <laughs> let's, let's approach this as an experiment. You can try these things. And yeah, then, because I, I have a pea patch also. So it uh -huh. is a raised bed. Okay. It's, it's level. Mm -hmm. That's great. It you gets... can try these things and approach it the way Edison did the light bulb. <laughs> it's an experiment. And if this filament doesn't work, then the, you know, the next one might. <laughs> so we can do it. And um, it's hard not to invest a lot of my self-esteem in carrots because you just wonder what's <laughs> going on over there and you pull them out, right? And you think it looks so good on the top. Um, but these are some things that you can try and you'll get data and then you'll, you'll learn okay okay so the, yeah the slope of the bed is because sometimes people will put 
carrot seed in a, on a sloped bed and then water it and all the carrots grow at the bottom end because mm. the carrot seed flushes down. So this is the method is you can clear yourself a wide band like with your hand, like a highway, instead of one tiny skinny row, you can make it a row that's like wide. And then you can sprinkle a lot of carrot seed in there. So the reason I say that is only for people who can't get their carrots to come up is one way to, to uh, make up for that is to seed pretty heavily. And then if they all come up, you thin them. You wanna give space between your carrot rows. So at least a foot apart between the rows helps because um, I don't know if you're in the first class, but there are these drawings of what carrot roots would like to do if they can spread out. And it's like feet of carrot root coming off of the, it's not just, the carrot is not just that thing we eat. There's just tons of roots coming off of it under the soil. So it needs that space between them. Um, so for getting bigger ones, um, well, if you have trouble having, making them come up, that's when I seed heavily. And then I cover it with just a little quarter inch of potting soil and gently pat that down and water that gently. So you wanna water before you put the seed in. And then that way you don't have to water very heavily um, after you've seeded. And then you have to keep them wet. So if anybody has trouble keep getting carrots to come up at all, um, it's often because we let them dry out. You know, we think, well, I only let them dry out once, but that's like, you know, only letting your puppy completely dry out once. The ingrate didn't grow. Um, these are babies, right? So they need to be uh, not dry out basically. And then this is how we thwart the carrot rust fly. It sounds like a lot of faff, but you're gonna get yourself a piece of reme and you're not gonna weed it and you're not gonna thin it until you have that piece of reme or agrabon fabric. And then you're gonna cut it much bigger than your bed. What did I say here? Three feet longer and three feet wider than where, whatever your carrot bed is. Because we wanna be able to put it on but have it billow up so that when the carrots get big, they grow into this thing and they fill it up. They're gonna need a lot of space, kind of like old Jiffy Pop popcorn ones. They're gonna mm. fill that up. It's gonna look weird at first because you have lots of fabric. So I've got my reme, I've got it cut and I'm not gonna weed or anything yet. I'm gonna cut straight down in the soil all the way around the carrot bed. So I have a rectangle of soil that's been cut all the way around the carrot bed, a few inches out from the carrots. And then, I'm going to weed the bed and I'm gonna thin the carrots. And if you really wanna be fancy, you cannot pull the carrots, you could snip them off because that way, if two of them are growing near each other, the one you pull out doesn't deform the one that stays in. So if you wanna be fancy, you can get your scissors and go snip, snip, snip. So they need to be one to three inches apart. If you're thinking big carrots, you may wanna put them two to three inches apart. As you're thinning them and weeding, you know how you can smell the carrot tops? So can the flies. <laughs> so that's why we have everything ready. And then you're going to take the corners of the reme and shove it in the corners of that soil slot that you cut. Shove the corners in and then punch the reme in either with your fingers or my favorite thing is a plastic pancake turner that we no longer use because it melted. <laughs> and I go and I shove it down in there. Um, that puts the reme under the soil level. If you just have it on top, the flies just go under. Or even if you put it down with rocks, they'll lay their babies next to the reme and the babies will crawl in. Jeez. <laughs> so that's like a spring summer thing. Brian McWhorter said, excuse me, <laughs> that. If you do an overwinter carrot planting where you plant them in like August and they get tiny, they grow really tiny and then they overwinter and they grow really fast in the spring, that you don't have to do reme, which I've never done it without reme, but I'm trying it. So I'll let you know how that goes. 
but you can see my little my little description of how to thwart the carrot rust fly. But <clears throat> once you know how to do it, it's not a big deal. You just, you know, it's like weeding or anything else. You just make sure you have that 30 minutes to get to do the weeding and all that. So how do you like them apples? It's worth a try. <laughs> you can try all the stuff you asked. Glad you asked. <laughs> now I have to do. Well, I'm glad you asked. You're probably not glad you asked. <laughs> no, it's a challenge, so I am glad. Um, I have a question. Oh, just yeah. a question. Um, so you said when you first plant them, then you water them twice a day um, as needed and, until they start to, until, they, until they're two inches? Or oh, no. The reason we're, that's great. Oh, did I cut you off? No, no, it's fine. Okay. The reason we are watering them twice a day, you don't really have to water them twice a day like this time of year because they're staying moist. We mm -hmm. just, I just wanted to acknowledge that if you're trying to do this, like I grow a big crop that I start on 4th of July. Okay. And, and they dry out really easily. So I pretty much know I should do it in a week when I'm working from home because I have to keep looking at them. Sometimes people, um, we'll put cardboard over so that they, or burlap sacks, so that they can keep that moist and it'll it'll shade them so they don't dry out. But when I do that, I have critters that go under and eat them. Right. And by critters, I mean like earwigs and, you know, all the stuff that likes to go under there. So I just water them at 10 in the morning and then again at three. And just until they're up and then, you know, then... You can water them less. Okay, and That's then a good on the thinning, then you said instead of uh, instead of pulling them out, then you just sometimes you just snip them so that you have the dominant one, and you leave that mm -hmm. one, and you snip the ones next to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Snip them off like um, they grow from the base of the leaves. You can see that mm -hmm. on here. So you want to snip pretty low because you want to stop that. If okay. you put them up here, they'll just grow more leaves, but they're tiny. So it's kind of hard to tell, but it just snip low. Okay. Yeah. Anything else about carrots or anything else that you might want to, to grow? Okay. So I have a question for you. You know what? I'm not looking at the chat right now. Right. So Fran says she thinks her carrots washed away. Okay. So my question for you is, um, do you know what the hungry gap is? I think that's a no. The hungry gap is in climates like ours. So it's basically us and England. Um, the root crops at this time, if you don't have refrigeration, like traditionally, they would start to either rot or sprout. And so there's not a lot of carbohydrate food and it's too early to get any crops. So there are lots of plants that you can grow to fill in this hungry gap. So this picture right here is what we are eating out of our garden now or soon. Um, that we overwintered and they produce now. And you can't do it with just any old cauliflower and broccoli. You have to have certain varieties and there are certain varieties of carrots that work better. And um, this isn't lettuce, this is escarole. So if you're interested, I think I'm gonna address this in a future class anyway, I'd like to tell you about how you can get food during what's called the hungry gap. Because if you think about it, you're not eating much about from your garden. February, even into May, a lot of times people say, oh, you must be harvesting so much from your garden and it's May and you're getting lettuce and the peas aren't even producing yet. So um, it's nice to have this opportunity to grow this food. It does take space, a little bit of space, um, but if you're interested, I will talk about that in uh, June, I think. Can you tell me what topics you'd like to cover in the future? It's definitely in the survey, but those in the survey 
are just um, ideas that I've heard from people so far. So does anybody have a topic they would like to cover? Just I giving love the you time idea to of think. Doing the hungry gap. Oh. Okay. John says hungry gap. I think a topic I'd like to understand better is replanting. So like I've done my peas already and they're uh -huh. coming up, but I don't understand enough about when to replant them or if it's not possible. And then the same with my beans that I'm going to be putting in a little later. And you mentioned lettuce. So I'm, I'm about to get some lettuce and then how long do I keep replanting lettuce? So it's the cycles and, and what, when do we replant uh, plant a, a vegetable that we've already planted? Oh yeah, yeah, that's called succession planting. That's one yeah. of the ways you can succession plant. And I talked about it, but I didn't say mm -hmm. do it at this interval, yeah. yeah. For lettuce, um, just quickly, since you can do lettuce uh, mm -hmm. pretty often, you can do it, um, some people do it every two weeks. It seems a little bit close, especially when it's cold weather and it's not really maturing very fast anyway. You look at your two week old lettuce and your four week old lettuce and it looks mighty close to the same. But when things get warmer, you can plant more frequently. Um, so anywhere from two, every two weeks, every three weeks or every four weeks, you can put lettuce in. So that's just timing. Um, but I will um, make a note about that. And yeah, I, I guess I'll probably put that in the survey as soon as I possibly can to see if um, if we get some interest. And I definitely can address it. Thank you. So we have hunger gap and succession planting. How about irrigation? Do people just water by hand? I'm trying to find somebody to talk to us about drip irrigation if we're interested. Somebody was very interested in drip irrigation. So I'm either gonna just send that person to this expert or I'm gonna try to get this expert to, he doesn't have time to talk to us, but, and I don't know that much about it, but he's going to try to set me straight about all the misconceptions about irrigation. But I have that already on the, um, in the survey for the end of this class. It would be great if you would let me know if you are or are not interested. We've Can anybody else come? Oh. For a long time. We've Pardon me, John? Hang on just a second. You don't make any noise. We've used drip um, irrigation for a long time. Uh, we are by no means experts. Well, it's good to know that you have some real life experience though. That's nice. Saves water. Yes. Yeah, it's pretty hard to save water, hand watering. You have to be really meticulous and like go right underneath the plants and everything. Okay. Well, let's see. So we carrot, we troubleshooted, troubleshot carrots and looked at the calendar. And I think we have shared everything. And I'm gonna ask you to fill out the feedback form if you would. To let me know, especially if you think of a topic or that if you'd like to rank topics that are already on that form, that would be really great because I will change things around um, based on what you need. John, did we already have the spring composting class through the library? Uh, no, um, John Barut is going to be there on, give me just a second, I have to look at my calendar. It's going to be Friday, June 3rd at the uh, at one o'clock at the library. It'll be back by the garden shed and he's going to come do a uh, usually he's about an hour, 90 minutes just talking about composting and John's been doing composting in the greater Puget Sound for probably close to 50 years at this point. He started in the 70s. Amazing. That is really great. <clears throat> Um, 
yeah, so in May, depending on what you say, we will probably talk about some pests and diseases and um, recognizing those symptoms and what to do about them. Like we just talked about um, rust fly in carrots and um, possibly attracting beneficial insects and things like that. And then in June, June's our canning, right, John? Oh, July. July. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. we're trying to okay. set up a canning class at uh, at Barn. We have most of the details in place at this point. I'll have a time and a uh, and a date next class. Yeah, that's nice. And that might be a different audience from this particular group, but there are a lot of people who are interested in preserving. Um, but we can also, within this class, if you want to, we can do like how to store crops in, how to make them last longer in the refrigerator. Somebody asked for that. And there are actually tips for that and how to make that, how to store them in the garage. If you grow pumpkins and things like that, that you want to store. But I would love to hear your feedback, please. Um, let me know what you want to learn. And we can always add that in. Thank you all for coming. I really, really appreciate that. Do you have any, um, Last words, John. I'm going to go ahead and put my email in the uh, in the chat, and uh, if you if you if you need to reach out and get a hold of anybody uh, to ask a gardening question, you can always email me, and I'll make sure it gets to Carol. At this point. Okay, I'm willing to put mine in as well. If you. Oh yeah. If you like. And I'm at the library Tuesday, goes well. Thursday, and Friday all day. Yeah, and people already have um, emailed me. I really appreciate that. We've done a lot of specific, I've been on a lot of specific answering of questions and forwarding of information and things like that. So thank you very much for coming. And I hope to see you. Yay. <laughs> I hope to see you. Um, the second Tuesday of May. Thanks Don't very be much. Don't afraid to tell your friends. Yeah, tell your friends <laughs> <laughs> from all over the county because it's Zoom, right? So it's easy to get to. Oh, the survey link. John, can you post the survey link, please? Yeah, that's the one at the bottom of the resource page. Yeah, um, it says April survey link. I don't know if I have I can that. take a peek. Okay, let me see. April class feedback survey right here. So I'm going to post it. There you go. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, everyone. And thank you, especially yeah. Carol. It's been wonderful. Lots of good information. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your great questions. Bring more, okay? And thanks for, you, for your personal experiences too. Really appreciate that. And I will see you in a month, I hope.